May I invite the next panel onto the stage? As you know, uh, decarbonization and ESG have really shot to the top of the maritime agenda during the pandemic, and the topic is also one of the main discussions taking place um, during Singapore Maritime Week. We're now going to hear from a very senior level panel comprised of ship owners, charters, and finance providers on how best to establish needed frameworks to effectively reduce and limit the environmental impact of the shipping industry. Um, Mr. Kang Sin of Standard Chart, who was uh, to moderate the session, couldn't unfortunately be with us today. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, his colleague, Ms. Amy Cho, Executive Director of Shipping Finance at Standard Chartered, who will be moderating the session. Amy, please. Hello. I'm Amy from the Shipping Finance team of uh, Standard Chartered Bank. I'm very honored to be moderating um, the panel, the first panel today, entitled Decarbonizing Shipping. I was just reading the news um, which was released yesterday which says that the US, the, the, the US and China has released a joint statement which confirms or, or announced the commitment of the climate change. So before we start, let me quickly welcome um, our panelists here um, for sharing with us their perspectives today. Uh, on my right, um, we have Mr. Jeremy Nixon, the Chief Executive Ex Officer of One Network Express. Prior to ONE, Jeremy has held senior management positions in major liners across Europe, North America, and Asia. And next is Mr. Rain P. Peterson, the Managing Director of MERS and also the Vice President of the Singapore Shipping Association. Rain is a council member of the Singapore National Employers Federation. And third, we have Mr. Peter Lai, uh, the head of shipping for the Anglo-American group. Prior to Anglo-American, Peter held various financial, commercial, and marketing roles at Rio Tinto. Last but not least, Mr. Joshua, Politics Deputy Managing Partner of Transport Capital. Prior to Transport Capital, Joshua was the director and general manager of Seacall Marine. Welcome, everyone. I, I like to reiterate three data points from Roger's slide earlier. And it's fundamental, but I thought I'll just say it again so that all of us will remember about it, which I think pretty much sums up the what of the discussion today. Number one, 3% of global CO2 emission which equivalents to 1 billion tonne is contributed by international shipping. Number two, amongst others, the IMO and EU have set goals to reduce greenhouse emissions by 50% by 2050. And last, and of course not least, to halve shipping emissions by 2050, about 1.4 to 1.9 trillion dollars of investment over the next three decades are estimated. So I'd I, I like to uh, open the floor up. Um, I, I just uh, would like to open the floor up later after the first round discussion so that if any of you have any questions that you'd like to direct to any of our panelists today, I would encourage you to start thinking about it, put it down, so that everyone would have an opportunity to ask questions other than myself today. So perhaps I would, I would start, um, Jeremy, now that IMO 2020 is behind us, and we have now IMO 2030, 2050, do you think key stakeholders' perspectives are considered sufficiently when these goals are put in place? What, what do you think are the steps required for ship owners industry groups, initiatives to ensure that these perspectives are, are continuously put, put, uh, taken into account by the regulators and, and so that we do not um, 
have the same uh, imposed regimes which are not workable. Is there any lessons that we could take um, uh, from, from IMO 2020 implementation? Over to you. Thank you, Amy. Well, first of all, I think um, we've got an extremely complex situation ahead of ourselves to, to, to get through uh, this whole decarbonisation journey. Um, but the first most important point is, is thank goodness we have the IMO. Thank goodness we have the maritime industry, we have a UN body which globally oversees uh, maritime affairs and shipping. So that's a great starting point. It's of course a political structure. It's made up of many countries with many different views, but at least we have one utilitarian system which we can approach. And, um, you know, we, we're all of us are involved either directly or indirectly uh, with that lobbying process because ultimately we have a series of countries which vote at the end of the day within, within the IMO. And, um, of course, us, uh, our individual companies, we should be lobbying our own individual uh, countries where we're based and lobbying for our views, but also, fortunately, we have common trade associations built around specific industry verticals like BIMCO or the World Shipping Council, Intercargo, et cetera, et cetera, who give their views. And then we have the ship-owning uh, associations, which are very prevalent in many, many countries of the world, including the SSA here in Singapore, which rolls up to the International Chamber of Shipping. Plus, we have the classification societies, we have all the consultants, we have a lot of academia, et cetera. So, Actually, there's an enormous amount of lobbying going on, an enormous amount of energy going into this, and steering this up to the, the, the bodies of the IMO. So that's, that's a good starting point. And um, I think if you, you, you touched on the 220, and the, the 220, as you might remember, back in January 220, we all had to switch uh, to the low-carbon fuel or go with scrubbers. At the end of the day, there was... There were some challenges in and around that, we know that, but at least that was an IMO decision with a very clear mandate. Uh, many of us would be talking three years ago about, well, is it going to be a level playing field? Is it going to be properly implemented? Are you going to go for scrubbers? Are you going to go for low sulfur fuel? Um, what will be the spread between the high and the low? But, you know, here we are two years on and, and that, well, year and a half on, that, that issue is largely resolved. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's gone, I think, reasonably smoothly. It is being implemented absolutely everywhere. Yes, uh, there is a spread between the high and the low sulfur fuel, which was around about $350 to $400 a tonne back in January 220, and today is probably at about $120, $130 a tonne. So whether you went for scrubbers or you went for the low sulfur fuel technology, you know, it, 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 it's, it's somewhat of a wash. So uh, I think that's worked well, and that gives us some confidence that we, we can move forward. Um, so very, very key thing now is the IMO is meeting in June. Uh, we have the MEPC 76, and we need to see a lot more meat put on the bone in terms of the carbon intensity indicators, uh, the EEXI, the EEDI, uh, which was referred to earlier uh, by Roger, um, and, and see how those specifics are gonna play out. And then I think, by the end of this year, we should really start to see a lot more clarity in terms of what we have to do, and then how do we collaborate as an industry to get, get to that. But at least the framework is coming together. So is the glass half full or half empty? In my view, the glass is half full. Thank, thanks, Jeremy. Just, just one quick follow-up question is that with all these industry groups, there's many, many industry groups, do you think the voices are being heard? Or do you think it's, it's a lot of proposals being put forward, but is it being taken into account? You think or, or it's, it's something that can be done better? Well, well I think you'll hear today, and, and, and you know, different country, com companies have got different strategies in terms of what their future car carbon decarbonisation programmes are going to be. But I think all of us requiring and requesting clarity around the framework, clarity about what the definitions are gonna be, clarity about standards. And I think we're all talking in a pretty unified voice on that. And I think that the, in the last couple of years, the cooperation between the various trade associations um, to come together and write joint papers and joint lobby in and around these issues has got a lot, lot better. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy, for that uh, view in terms of regulations. Rain, um, 2030 and 2050 is a long pathway. And with so much uncertainties and unknowns, right, would you be able to share MERS strategy in this journey? I'm 
I know that MERS have done a lot in this area. Perhaps the main obstacles and, and, and the workarounds um, that, is, that is available today. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, um, it's a big question and could be an entire <laughs> conference in itself, but uh, let me try to give it a go. Um, just to put it into perspective, um, in, um, in Maersk we own and operate around 700 container vessels. We buy more than 10 million tons of fuel every year, and uh, as such we are responsible for more than 30 million tons of CO2 emissions. So, uh, so this is something which is in, very important to us. Um, there are many stakeholders in this. Um, uh, number one for us is uh, the customers. The customers expect uh, us to decarbonize their supply chains. Um, we have talked uh, previously about uh, investors, uh, bankers, etc. They also have uh, demands in this, uh, in this area. Our employees have expectations and the society has expectations as we have discussed. So, uh, so this is something which is, is, is uh, high on our agenda and uh, it's an imperative, uh, strategic imperative. Um, luckily, we are not starting from scratch. If, if, if we use 2008 as baseline, uh, we are actually down with around 45-46% uh, of CO2 emissions per container. Our ambition is to get to 60, minus 60% 60 by 2030. And by 2050, uh, we, uh, we, we aim at a zero emission operation. The way we have worked with this is uh, to focus on the fuels. Uh, there has been a lot of talk in the previous presentation about fuels. Uh, and, um, and we are looking into uh, to, uh, biofuel, methanol, ammonia, lithium. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, so, uh, so it is a challenge. Um, as also mentioned in the previous um, uh, presentation, one thing is what we put in our engines and the engines we design. Uh, we need a lot of infrastructure before this fuel is actually reaching the vessel. Uh, and, uh, and that's for me to see one of the really big challenges for our industry. I, I, I think we can easily identify some technologies which can work, but do we really have the infrastructure to support that, uh, these, uh, these technology? It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Who is prepared to, uh, to uh, invest in big scale ammonia or biofuel or what do I know? if they can't be assured that there's a customer for this. So um, we have taken a, a small but first step. Uh, we have ordered our first uh, zero carbon emission vessel, a uh, small container vessel, 2000TU, that will be uh, ready for operation in 2023. It's, uh, it will be uh, a, a dual fuel engine. It will be methanol and it will be uh, diesel. Uh, and then we start there. So, uh, but but it's it's by no means necessarily the solution, but it's a start, and it's uh, it's a way of uh, showing some commitment to this, and and hopefully also to spark some thinking about uh, for those uh, stakeholders who has to invest in the in, in the in the infrastructure to 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 get to the next point for them to see that that we as an industry have skin in the game. And then, just on a final note, uh, um, I think it's important to focus on the ships, but uh, seen from our perspective, it's very much about supply chains. So what my customers expect from me is not that I can only decarbonize the, the, the sea leg of the transport in the future. It will be an end-to-end -end operation that needs to be decarbonized. Quick follow-up, Rained. I, I can't help myself, but ask this something that I don't quite understand. I see a lot of efforts. You just mentioned about uh, MERS investing in uh, various fields as, as pilot projects. Why do you think um, stakeholders are investing in different kind of projects? Or is it, is it about trial and error? 
Or why, why don't the industry focus on, like, say, I don't know, like two or three projects and get it right, focus the investments, and rather than s spread ourselves too thin? Is that, is that a consideration? Or? It's a good question. But I, I think you have to approach it slightly different. Um, it's not about choosing the right technology. We are on a journey. The next 10 years, we will be testing technologies. And then I'm pretty convinced that after some time, those uh, we as, as ship owners, the industry, will converge in our thinking, and then we will focus on maybe a few, two or three uh, technologies. But we are at a, we are at a, at, um, at a point in time where we are going from classic fossil fuel to something else. And, uh, and, and uh, just picking the winning fuel or the winning technology may not be the right solution. I actually think it's a very healthy process that we are testing different technologies because this is not a technology for the years or for the decades. It's a technology that we will probably be, uh, be with us for 50 or 60 years. So it's very important that we get this right. And yeah, we need to test and, and do our, uh, our share of the mistakes. In, indeed. Thank, thanks, Rain, for uh, giving me a piece of your thought about that. Um, Peter, um, as a leading global mining company and as a, as a charter of the vessels, how does Anglo-American evaluate the business case in electing for comparatively pricier but uh, greener ships to be used in your supply chain? And uh, uh, do you see Chartra and owners sharing the cost? What's your thoughts? What's the consideration uh, when you think about that? Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Amy, for having us. Um, so, yeah, look, I think that's a, it's a really challenging question. It comes up a lot. Who's going to pay for this? Um, and, and I don't think we, we necessarily have the answer yet. But maybe just starting with some of the thinking in our organisation. So, you know, uh, like many, but we are we're very focused on uh, reducing um, our, our emissions uh, and decarbonising our ocean freight. Uh, it's a very important factor of our scope three emissions um, as a business. And we've been working extremely hard over the last few years um, to really focus on meaningful projects, meaningful activity working with the industry, which I think is, is, is fundamental, whether it be regulatory, technology, infrastructure, um, to really try and move things forward. And I think that's something that I think we find um, is really quite refreshing in the maritime space and, 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 and we really uh, you know, appreciate those opportunities. And I think you know, our, our involvement in the Global Maritime Forum, where we're a partner, um, we're a foundation signatory of the Sea Cargo Charter, um, is really sort of putting um, you know, our, our, our Anglo-American brand at the forefront and, and trying to uh, you know, make a change in this space as a, as a charterer. Um, I think, you know, why do we do it? Um, which, is, which is always, you know, and this is leading to the point of, of, of why it's important. I think um, the point was just made. It's, 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 it's really relevant. It's what our customers demand and it's what our customers' customers demand. Um, and our key stakeholders, whether it be our communities where we operate our mining operations or our ports, um, whether it be our employees, whether it be our, our, our investors. Uh, this is the direction that, that we must take. Uh, it's the right thing to do and, and, and that's why we shift down this path. So, but it is also appropriate that when we think about these opportunities and, and decarbonising our, our ocean freight um, is to be prudent and, and careful around the commercial aspects and that, that's something that you know, is, is certainly challenging in the current uh, environment. But on the flip side, always be prepared and be willing to be bold to take some of those opportunities as they, as they arise. And I think that's certainly the sort of thinking that we, we have in, in our organisation. So when we look at um, the decarbonisation opportunities and particularly moving down that path from a, from a chartering perspective, um, we, when we look at our longer term projects, we do price carbon into our evaluations. Uh, that is something that we, that, that we consider. Um, we obviously look at uh, efficiencies and, and, and operational gains, which tend to lead to good commercial outcomes anyway. They always have, um, so we continue to do that. Where it gets challenging is that real step change, that real technological step change. Um, and I think it's, it's really around understanding the risks that flow from start to finish, and I think as, as just was alluded to, it's 
all well and good to have a zero emission vessel, but you need to have the regulatory framework, the infrastructure to be able to support um, that going forward, and particularly in a business like ours, where we focus very much on, on large deep sea trade um, in, in some, some quite remote places. Uh, that infrastructure to be able to support is, is, is really um, quite key. And I think being able to, to link those opportunities into more fundamental um, decarbonisation or energy efforts that go beyond marine, I think that's where there is some potential uh, opportunities. And we've certainly seen that in, uh, in South Africa, which is one of the um, our, key, um, our key operating areas. So uh, I guess I've danced around it a little bit. Who pays for it? Uh, I guess to some degree, um, you know, sitting with, with owners and the, the age-old comment that the customer will pay, um, or if you speak to an owner and, well, I'll build it for you if you pay for it, I think we need to think a little bit more beyond that. Uh, it's more about collaboration. Um, I think in this transition phase, there is going to be uh, an effort to work together, and I think that's what we've certainly seen uh, in the forums that we've been involved in, Getting to Zero Coalition and, and some of the others that are, have been mentioned. I think the, um, the momentum is there. Um, we will see where the regulatory piece stands, and, and, and there's obviously questions around levies and, uh, and, and carbon structures. Um, and I think that has the potential to uh, facilitate if done properly. Um, but I think it is really going to come down to, to all players uh, in the market. And, and I think certainly what we've seen, um, and, and I think we should be very proud um, about what has happened in this industry. There is a lot of really good will and good intent out there. Uh, and I think we should all be, uh, be confident that we'll move things forward um, in, in not only the right way, but in a, in, in a way that uh, is, is commercially sound for all of us. So, Peter, um, Anglo-American now is also a ship owner, not too long ago, right? Um, can I just understand your thought about this uh, a little bit more? Because um, uh, before this, Anglo-American is not a ship owner. Does that mean that uh, you are not able to find what you are looking for uh, within the team of deca decarbonizing shipping or... Or, or you like to take things into your own hands. So, so can you share with us your thoughts? Um, we're not actually a ship owner. Um, we, we, we do uh, operate ships um, uh, on, on long-term long charter, um, and that's, uh, that's, that's our uh, approach to, to, to shipping. Um, we have recently um, um, concluded uh, a series of long-term charters for LNG uh, fuel ships um, that will deliver um, in, uh, in, in, in 2023. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that's been a, a, an important step for us in, in moving down the decarbonisation path. Um, but I think to, to put some thinking behind it, I think for us we are fundamentally a, 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 a charterer, um, but it is important that, you know, we work with our partners, uh, being the ship owners, ship operators in particular, um, to, to move our cargo in a, in a, in a safe uh, and, uh, and sustainable way. Um, we think our brand, uh, we think our position in the market um, to be able to facilitate and have a say um, to try and move things along is, is very powerful. Um, I think we acknowledge our limitations as not being an owner, but we also very much acknowledge our influence as being a large charterer. And we think uh, charters do have a role to play. Um, sometimes we get forgotten, but I think we're, we're very important to the conversation. Um, and, and I think our influence is very much part of that, uh, that decarbonisation push. Thanks. Thanks for giving us a piece of your thought. Um, I'll direct my next question to, to Joshua. Um, currently, Joshua, as you know, or at least for the traditional ship financing space, we know that appetite is generally, uh, not all the time, bifurcated with appetite focusing on large players ship owners. Obviously, there are different channels for mid-tier players as well. But oftentimes, it may mean limited channels or, or higher cost. Do you agree with this observation? And, and do you see this trend changing with the willingness of these mid-tier players in contributing to this emission reduction agenda? How, how do you see this playing out? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I agree completely. I mean, at the moment, there, there is green finance available, but it's very, very much limited to the large players, right? I mean, if you have on, on the bank finance, 
Um, you know, there's a lot of banks who have signed up to Pesadian principles, but there has been a very big flight to quality over the past decade, and that is very much focused on, on the top tier, the, the big balance sheets, the large ship owners. Um, Chinese leasing has funded a number of these, you know, new alternative fueled vessels. Um, but again, that there's been a flight to quality there, and the, and the target market is not the midsize. And the third way these ships have been financed have been, you know, in the bond market, green and sustainability linked bonds. Again, very much uh, reserved for the bigger players. And I think that, that is the key reason. I mean, if you look at the order book for, for alternative fuel vessels, you know, be it dual fuel, be it batteries, be it whatever it is, it's almost exclusively, other than the very niche or the, you know, the, the harbor or, or, or short sea segment, it's very much the, the large players who, who have made those orders. And obviously, finance is, is the, one of the keys, right? I think it's finance and it's also, there is no silver bullet to this problem, right? I think there's a lot of different solutions. It's not like cars where you can say, okay, it's gonna be electric, it's gonna be batteries, we know where we're going, we just need the economics to work. You know, a lot of people are saying, okay, yes, I, I'm gonna bet on ammonia or hydrogen. That, that's all nice to say, but it doesn't exist today, right? And we hope it will, it will exist soon, but you know, a lot has to be done to get there. So there are a number of solutions available today, but it's not easy for a medium-sized ship owner who has maybe a fleet of 30 or 40 vessels to get familiar with each, um, with each technology. So we think the demand is, is really there. I mean, in speaking to medium-sized ship owners, their charterers also are asking or even demanding because they have their own scope three emissions and that's only increasing. So the key, those, those two key, fac key factors are the reason why you're not seeing more and more um, uh, ship owners or medium-sized ship owners go ahead with these projects. And to be frank, we need them to, right? Because it's great that the big guys are doing it, but medium-sized ship owners represent over a third of the fleet. And if they don't get on board, we're not gonna decarbonize shipping. So, and at the same time, you have huge pools of capital in the world looking for sustainable and kind of ESG-focused strategies. But there are no vehicles yet that can kind of funnel that capital into, you know, what ship finance, which is a, a quite a niche activity, and then focus, you know, long-term, um, reasonably priced um, uh, finance, because these new ships are never going to be cheaper than a conventionally fueled vessel, right? You'll always have a, uh, uh, an increase in CapEx upfront. You can argue that maybe the OPEX might be lower, LNG is currently cheaper than fuel oil, but you have that big upfront cost. So you need a long-term and competitive finance to be able to go ahead, even if your charter is out there offering you, say, a five or 10-year contract. Um, and we think that's a huge opportunity, right? Th there is a need to channel that we don't think it's necessarily gonna be the banks who are gonna all of a sudden change strategy. They have their own you know, issues behind it. There's a reason for that flight to quality. Again, for, for the, current, the current available options, it's not easy to get them to kind of change course and focus on the medium size. But we see a huge opportunity for you know, new, um, more nimble kind of vehicles. And I'm a huge believer in consolidation. I think you do need large companies, but you don't only need large companies. And companies aren't good just because they're large. You know, you, you've seen it for, for decades. These medium-sized ship owners run by strong families. They're extremely entrepreneurial. They have their own skin in the game, right? You know, there, there is a big place for them. You need entrepreneurial kind of thrifty companies to get through the next 30 years. So we don't see them going away. I mean, obviously there will be consolidation and there are, there are economies of scale, but it won't only be big companies. And we need to find a way to channel, you know, sustainable finance to these medium-sized ship owners because they are one of the key and important parts to get ourselves to decarbonize the maritime industry. Joshua, you touch upon that these channels are not quite there or, or there's not sufficient of these channels. What kind of trend or what do you imagine this, these channels would be um, to, to channel this capital, uh, ESG capital to, to these mid-tiers? Um, is, there, is, there, is there such established channels today or you see that it's going to, to proliferate over the next five, 10, 15 years? Yes, look, I mean, I think there are a few, but really in their infancy. Um, I think it will start because I think, you know, it's, the landscape will be a little bit different, right? These ships are not gonna be ordered to trade spot, 
these ships are going to be ordered on the back of long-term contracts. So it's a very different risk profile, which I think you can get more comfortable with. I mean, shipping has been very volatile. You know, there's been the whole kind of asset play aspect to it. I think for these newer deals, it will be very much charter-driven, who will say, you know, okay, we can offer you a long-term commitment because we want to reduce our own emissions. And then on the back of those cash flows, you know, with strong owner-operators, I think, yes, that, that will, I mean, it's starting. It's, uh, it's starting more on a kind of, on a, on a niche regional basis in Europe. We're seeing a few of these funds who are directing capital um, in, into that. But I think it will only increase because, in essence, I mean, we have regulations in, in, in the maritime industry, which are good, and I agree the IMO is, is, is we're, we're extremely lucky to have it, but we are a little bit, you know, at a disconnect with society, right? You know, coming from the consumer to the charters, more and more people are aligning themselves with the Paris goals, which mean, you know, that's zero by 2050, not 50%. You know, more and more you're seeing the EU ETS. I mean, from the 1st of January, carbon will have a price. Is it the right price? Is it enough? But it will have a price. So we think those trends are only going to continue. And, you know, it, it will change in large part, you know, how the industry operates because it's not that straightforward to go ahead and how can you afford to pay 20 or 30% more for your ship um, just because it has lower emissions. You obviously need an economic basis to do that. And I think all that will come, but I'm very optimistic, you know, that, you know, it's a little, I mean, you can call it a bubble or not. There, there is a lot of capital right now chasing very few opportunities. And you see that, you know, bringing valuations on, on the green or ESG side. But there are some, you know, shipping is a very hard to decarbonize industry, but it's not necessarily harder than others, right? I think the technology is, to a certain extent, there. It's the fuels available at scale and at economy, uh, the zero carbon fuels available at economy. So you have a solution in play, right? But, you know, you need the first movers to go out to build the ships, to build all that out. And I think more and more, you know, we will do that. And it, of course, importantly, will be the big first movers, but very much so the medium-sized companies will and, and need to, to follow through. Thanks, Joshua. I, li I like to hear that view about mid-tier players. Th thanks very much. Um, I I'd like to shift gears a little bit. I know that it's, it's, it's after lunch. Um, the next sort of 10 minutes, I would like to invite um, panelists to also have a think at, before I reach out to the floor for if, if there's any questions to, to see if you have any questions for another panelist, for example, to, you know, what's your... How do you do this? And, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I'd like to open it to the floor. Um, if anyone has any question um, for our panelists today. So um, I'll probably give it uh, 30 seconds or so um, to see if anyone would like to have a question for our panelists today. Any questions? And sorry, um, before we go on, uh, it would be helpful if you state your name, where you're coming from, and uh, uh, whether your question, who, who would you like to direct your question to? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is James, uh, working at GFW Small Company Singapore. My question for uh, Mr. Peter, Anglo-American. Yeah, we are talking about today a lot of uh, green energy and solar wind farm and something like that, which I also hold that these uh, industries require a lot of natural resources in the end, like iron ore, coal, copper, even plastic. So Anglo-American company is mining company. Do you see that increased mining activity now? Even we are talking about green energy. Yeah, thanks for the for the question. Um, yeah, look, there are a, a range of commodities that that, that we're involved in: um, uh, iron ore, copper, nickel, um, platinum, palladium, um, crop nutrients. We goes on. We're we're quite diversified. Um, uh, yeah, look, I, I think we we have particularly um, in the platinum and palladium space. Uh, we're the largest uh, uh, global producer of, of platinum uh, in, in in southern Africa. Um, and that's, uh, we've seen that, the momentum and the interest around those particular products, particularly into fuel cells, catalytic converters and the like, um, has, been, um, has been quite strong for quite some time and, and continues to, 
to, to, to gain momentum um, and not just you know, not so much from a marine front but more from a, from a commercial front and, and cars uh, in, in, in particular um, and I think that's certainly flowing through into some of the uh, the metallic products that we we produce as well as said copper and nickel being uh, being being primary so um, so look it's you know I think for you know in, in from our perspective our purpose as, as a as a as a company is to reimagine mining to improve people's lives um, and that's very much thinking um, you know how do we how do we move our business forward how do we make it better uh, for the society and the stakeholders that, that, that we engage in and I think the commodities that, that we are uh, that we hold uh, that we are investing in and that we're growing in uh, is very much key to um, to, to decarbonisation so it's, it's it's something that's very much on our radar as we think about our next five ten years uh, and investments as a business going forward. Thanks, James, for your question. Um, is there any question from the floor? Yes, I, I, I see a, a raise of hands. Sorry, Abhishek, um, that gentleman has raised his hands first. <laughs> so, please. Thank you. Hi, um, Alex Gray from Lockton International Insurance Brokers. Um, I suppose my question is for the panel as a whole, but mainly um, Jeremy, just because of the comments made. It's about IMO 2020, and during the build-up, there was huge speculation in the press about um, whether or not people would be ready. Um, scrubber slots were being traded like commodities. Uh, there were countdowns on websites. Um, so I wanted to gauge what the true magnitude of the challenges were to comply with IMO 2020. Were they as they were reported, or was it the millennium bug of shipping? Because, of course, it happened at the same time as the COVID uh, outbreak was gathering pace. So it wasn't just overshadowed. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's uh, 18 months on. Um, it's, it's nothing, I don't think, in the executive boardrooms of all, all the ship owners and charters. I mean, we, we don't really talk about it anymore. Some of us may think we're a bit underweighted in scrubbers and think that scrubber technology will get, may get better or may get banned or whatever. I mean, there's a few uh, things like that. It does seem that the, um, the one consequence of the aviation fuel market reduction in demand was that there was then more distillates available which meant that the uh, oil majors then used these distillates more for blending purposes for the low sulfur fuel oil and less decoking, and maybe that's going to start switching back slightly the other way or something like that. But really, I think, you know, j just back to this point about level playing field and, and predictability, and that was really all of our worries. You know, could we, could we get enough low sulfur fuel oil? Or could we get enough scrubbers? And secondly, could we pass it on to the customer? And um, I think... In hindsight, we've been able to resolve those issues, and, and, and most importantly, we have been able to pass it on to the customer. Um, whether on the bulk sector or on the container shipping side, I, I think that, that, that's all very successful. I think it just shows, though, the, um, the challenge we have now for the 230 and the 250, and really the two key things, I think, out there for all of us is, is can we, as a global economy, create enough of this carbon-free fuel at scale? And of course, that's not just a maritime issue. That, that's, that's a, every industry's got that issue. Every country's got that issue. Can we produce enough green hydrogen or ammonia or LNG or, or, or methanol at scale big enough? And if we can, I think that's very, very promising. But as we all know, that all hinges back to the issue in and around uh, uh, sustainable power. But something we've not talked about today, and I'm not particularly advocating it, but... Um, I do have a lot of respect for Bill Gates. And uh, for those of you who got a bit bored and looked through a lot of Netflix stuff over the last six months, um, do have a look at Netflix's um, thing around Bill Gates and about his uh, Terra Power nuclear uh, project, which nearly came off um, with the Chinese back in 2015 and could, could be another way forward. But you know, if you could create um, green fuels without having to completely rely on renewable energy, but be able to create it in a safe way with nuclear power, that could be quite a game changer. Bit left field, may not happen. I think the second one is um, 
this issue around how much will uh, the UN, IMO, governments intervene in terms of carbon taxes? And uh, will we see these market-based measures be relatively slight to start with and then gradually ramp up? Or could we see a real knee-jerk reaction to all the developments which are going on now around the environment and the governmental level and the COP26 coming up in Glasgow, where we suddenly see a very, very heavy-handed approach on that? And if that happens, that would really put the cat amongst the pigeons and would also mean retrofitting. We'd have to go much, much more seriously on retrofitting the existing fleet for carbon intensity reduction. We'd have to look at um, CO2 carbon capture much more, more seriously um, because the economic value of, of, of running the ships would be so heavily impacted. So I think that, you know, to me, those are the two, the two things going forward is this issue around can we really get to cheap, plentiful, safe carbon fuel? And secondly, what will be the uh, MPH uh, reaction? Thanks, Jeremy. That, that, was, that was a nice thought that you put it out there. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a, a lot of time left, um, and I would like to wrap this up. But before I wrap this up, I'd like to invite the panellists to, to give your quick thought about what, what is your predictions. Um, it could be crazy, it could be uh, uh, bold, uh, for the next five to ten years. Uh, uh, why don't you we start with uh, Joshua? Okay. Um, within the next five to ten years, look, I think the, the trends are moving and they're irreversible. I would say that within the next ten years, um, shipping will have its own net zero uh, by 2050 goal, and I would say carbon will have a price. I, I don't know what that will be. I think it will be more than you know, $2, maybe less than uh, 100 but, you know, I, I don't know. I see what the EU is doing, and a lot of times we follow the EU. I think that within the next 10 years, it's, it's realistic to give a non-negligible prob probability that we will have to do a lot more than we're expecting right now. Thanks, Joshua. Peter? Uh, quickly, two things for me. First, um, hopefully I can get on a plane and get home um, to, to see some family. That'll be the first one. Um, but I would agree with that. I think, uh, I think we will see um, targets, um, I guess what the right word is, intensify, or certainly the, the bar will be, be, be lifted and we'll need to move a lot quicker. Thanks. Rain? Thank you. Uh, I'm really not into predictions, uh, but I, I want to stress that for most of us in this room, working with shipping, this is probably the biggest challenge in our life. Um, I think we will deal with it, we will manage it, and we will be good at it. Um, just now, um, we see some first movers. Um, don't be afraid of that. Uh, by the end of the day, we have to collaborate about this. It's, it's, uh, we have to solve it as an industry. We can't solve it individually, however big you are. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, Andreas mentioned that uh, we will soon have a decarbonization center here in, in Singapore. We also have maritime uh, decarbonization centers elsewhere, but collaborate. And, and uh, as, as, uh, as um, Jeremy mentioned, a lot is going on in the industry organizations. Uh, even if you are a small or medium-sized owner, involve yourself, uh, and then you can actually have a seat at the table and have influence. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Rain. Jeremy. Yeah, just to echo key points, collaboration, completely agree. We can, we're only going to get there through collaboration, human ingenuity. Just look what we did on the vaccines in the last uh, six, nine months. Unbelievable. People said it takes five years. Look, look how we did it. If the climate is really the number one agenda and we don't get blown off course from that, I, I think we can, we'll, we'll move very quickly. I think we'll get there. I think we won't get there how we think we're going to get there today, but we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting topic. Thank you.